Hi. Hello. You want to say anything? Um, so you're going to go through this real quick? Yeah. Okay. So pay attention. If you think of a question that you have, go ahead and maybe write that down. Um, and no, then if you have a question, just ask. Ask right off? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead That's and ask right off then. Um, Hi. And if you guys do need to leave, if you don't have the ability to stay here for the whole time, that's fine. That's understandable. No, they can't leave. no. Oh, okay. So totally changing things up. You guys cannot go until four o'clock. You're gonna stay here. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I, uh, you have Ms. Rogers who knows psychology, uh, but two people who know the same amount of psychology who sit down on May fourth. Yes? Yeah. Less than a month? Mm -hmm. ah! A month today. You're not panicking, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, who know the same amount of psychology and take the same test, will they necessarily get the same grade? No. No, they won't. So part of this is knowing the psychology, and that's a must. You've got to know the psychology. You cannot fake your way through this test. Sorry. That'd be nice. You can some tests, right? Just not this test. Okay? Not any AP test. So what I'd like to do today is to tell you some things about how the exam is scored and what happens to your test after uh, it leaves your grubby little paws on May 4th uh, that may help you, uh, particularly on the free response part, but also on the multiple choice a little bit, because I, I, I don't mean to brag, but I have as much experience with scoring the exams as anybody on the planet. I'm one of two people that's been to every reading since the exam was born back in 1992. So just by virtue of the fact that I'm old, Okay, it gives me an advantage. It's kind of nice okay, being able to have the it, it advantages. So I put together a little PowerPoint, um, and I also put it in my Dropbox. And if you would like to go back and access it later, the URL is at the bottom. And that's also the last slide, so you don't have to decide now. You can wait and see if it's worthwhile. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about the AP exam. Some of the stuff you know, some you don't know, but uh, seriously, if you have any questions at all, just ask them right away, because I, I just assume you will put it in so when you want to know it. Um, one thing that won't help you with the exam, but I think it's interesting, is just the growth of the AP psychology exam uh, in the 20-some years that it's been around. So that first year, 1991, 1992, just under 4,000 kids took the test, and this year, uh, well over a quarter of a million students will, will take the test. This growth in test taking is the fastest acceleration through the first 20 years of any course in the AP program. You know how many AP tests there are? Care to guess? 30 40. something. 40, 30? 10 and 20. 10 and 20. It's like 35. Oh. It changes every once in a while. Most people are surprised. Because not many schools teach anywhere near all of them. I know one guy named Joe Lamas who teaches in Miami, uh, and he says his school, which over 5,000 students in it, he claims that they teach every AP course, but that's really pretty unusual. So it's become a big thing. It's like in seventh place in terms of all the AP exam, uh, exams that are given. Uh, and you're not going to be alone uh, when you sit down to take the test uh, next month. And you all know this, right? How many of you have taken AP tests previously? And how many of your AP versions? Just down around. Um, uh, every test, no matter what subject it is, gets scored on the same five-point scale. Okay? And this scale is a message to colleges and universities that you may be interested in attending about how well prepared you are in the particular subject area uh, for the course you took. So the only five scores you can get are five, four, three. Those are considered passing scores, although the college board doesn't say that. They're too polite to say that that passing the test is to get a 3, 4, or 5. And what qualified means is that you're qualified to receive credit, college credit for the high school work that you've done. Um, and the way the test is normed, typically, is to, and to convince colleges and universities that, that this test has some substance, is they do comparability tests every five years. And so this, every five years, the same test that you take as a high school student is given to college students who are completing the introduction to psychology. And they norm the test in such a way that if you score a five, you're scoring as well as A students in the college course. If you score a four, you're scoring as well as B students. And they have numbers to prove that. This is a, a, a test that, whose validity comes from these comparison tests. So the colleges can feel justified in giving you the score. Now, they can't tell colleges what to do. They recommend that colleges give credit for scores of three or above. 
And the last time I checked, which was last year, every college and university in Iowa did that. You know, every once in a while they go crazy and do something weird. Okay, but to my knowledge, every college and university in Iowa gave scores uh, for three and above. Two and one, that you screwed up. Okay, you're not going to get any credit for that. Okay, so you want to get at least uh, of typically a four uh, is a good safe score. Two parts to the test, you know this. The first part is the multiple choice. And if you have uh, specific questions about this, hold me down. But we're going to go through this fairly quickly. You get 100 questions. Five answer choices per question. That's basically tradition. There's no good reason for that. Data indicates that four answer choice, multiple choice, do just as effective job of weeding out people who don't know. But this is the way the APs have always been. The questions are in random order. It used to be they were in order from the easiest to the hardest. They changed that four or five years ago. They're now in random order. So you're going to get easy questions and hard questions all the way through. You get 70 minutes for this part of the exam. That works out to 42 seconds per question, which is probably about what you give them in class for your tests, Ms. Rogers? Um, I don't, we just have a certain number of questions per test that we take. How many are on your test? 50. 50, so you, you're probably used to working a little bit more quickly uh, than this rate. You get about three quarters of a minute for each one. And there is no time prompt from the proctor. Okay? If you read the instructions that the proctor gives, they are not instructed to give a time prompt, which I think is weird. I think what they're worried about is that a lot of the people who talk to the exams are, are volunteers and they're afraid they're going to get so caught up in the crossword puzzle or they'll be asleep. So some kids would get the time prompt and some kids wouldn't and they don't view that as fair. So to try to make it fair for everybody, there's just no time prompt. Now, they don't use the same philosophy for the essays, which is kind of weird. Two-thirds of the overall exam credit. Okay. How many of you had to say right now, if you're more frightened of the multiple choice portion of the test or the free response part of the test, how many would say that you're frightened of the multiple choice? You've got to pick one, you can't pick both. How many are more frightened of the essays? Okay, that, that's pretty typical. But the essays don't count for nearly as much. Okay, I'll show you in a little bit. It's possible to not even answer the questions. Say, hey, I'm not feeling those essays. That seems like a lot of work. And just leave them blank and still get a four on the exam. Okay, pretty easy to get a three on the exam. The place where you're going to amass your credit is the multiple choice. Okay, that's where you really need to know the specific details of psychology, because that's where you'll pick up your grade. The free response, the freaks. <laughs> free response questions, freaks. Okay. Uh, you get two of those. They're equally weighted. They have equal impact. You get 50 minutes for this, which boils down to an average of 25 minutes per question. But you can allocate that time any way you want. You can spend 49 minutes on the first question and one minute on the second question. But you'd be well advised to split it about equally. So you'd think they'd give a time prompt halfway through. And we'll talk about how to deal with this in a little bit. This is one third of the overall exam credit. So it has much less impact, even though these questions are much scarier. The instructions call for you to write in dark blue or black ink. Have you been requiring them to do that? I have. That? And what if they don't? I'll just write it on their FRQ for next time. Oh, I know. Nice. I would like to electrocute people. <laughs> I, I wanted people to follow this. Can you guess what happens if you were to space this off when you take your real exam on May 4th and write it in the test score? Can you say it again? It doesn't get scored. It does get scored. You can write it in blue or black ink. You can write it in day glow orange. You can write it in pencil. You can prick your finger and write it in your own blood if you want to. And if they can read it, they'll score it. What you will do is irritate your reader. You think, this bozo can't even follow directions. And if there comes a point in your answer where you're right on the fence, and that happens in almost every answer where that reader has to make a decision, should I award a point here or should I not award the point here? If that reader is unhappy with you, guess what? You ain't going to get the point. So this is the no-brainer part of it, to follow directions. But if you should space this off and walk out, and all of a sudden, as you just turned your exam and you're stepping out, you're ah, I wrote it in pencil. Don't let that destroy your whole summer, okay? Because your essay still will be read. You'll just have pissed off your reader. That's all. That's not the worst thing. Okay, we'll get over that. How is your grade determined? Okay, so here's how it actually happens. Each test is put on a 150-point scale. Okay, so you get a score out of 150 possible points. You get a maximum of 100. Now that makes sense because how much weight does the multiple choice get? 
two-thirds, and 100 is two-thirds of 150. They're pretty smart. They got this nailed. Okay. So you get 100 points for the multiple choice, and that means that each question is worth a point. You get the question right, you ratchet up a point. Okay. You leave it unanswered or answer it wrong, doesn't change your grade. The uh, FRQs are worth 25 points each. Now, they've got a problem because they aren't 25-point rubrics. Okay, the rubrics tend to be six points or seven points or eight points. So they have to mathematically go back and recalibrate each one. So if the question was an eight-point question and you scored a rubric point, you'd get 3.125 on the 150-point scale. That means if you aced that essay and got eight out of eight, what's eight times 3.125? 25, and you get your full credit for it. Now, if you're not mathy, don't worry. <laughs> Just be comfortable that they're going to manipulate this properly. If it's a seven-point rubric, then each rubric point is worth 3.571. They actually want beyond that. Okay? They go to like six or seven decimal places. Okay? To get as close as they can to that possible 150. So if you get uh, all 100 multiple choice right and get every available point on both rubrics, you get 150 out of 150. And every year, out of the quarter million students who take the test, somewhere between zero and one will achieve that. Okay, two years ago, there was a kid who got a perfect paper on the test. Okay, the guy who runs the college board tweeted it out, and, and nobody ever knew who it was. I'm pretty sure it was a CF kid. Who else would it be? Pretty sure. I'm not 100% sure, but why not? Why not think that? It's a good thing. Questions here? Now, most of the kids you sit down and take the test with on that day, they won't know how this is done. But, uh, to me, it's kind of comforting to know what's going to happen with it. So how well do you need to do? Now, what's Miss Rogers, Miss Rogers' grading scale? You have to have 90% for an A? 93. 93? Woo! That's good. And, and what, 85 for a B, somewhere like that? You know your own scale. What do you have to have to pass? Not that you're ever down even close to seventy percent to pass it. Yeah, I just go by whatever the district scale is. I have not even memorized it yet. It's not ninety eighty seven anymore. I don't know. Well, you know, it's something like that, right? Okay. Well, this changes every year. Okay, so it, it's not the exact same break points every year. That's one of the things that the person in charge, a woman called the chief reader, is to show in a little bit. Uh, her job is to get on a big conference call with all the statisticians from the college board and look at the comparability studies and so forth and draw these lines. But I took like three or four years and did the averages. And for uh, the averages, you would need 112 points out of how many? Mm -hmm. Out of 150 to be in that range where you get a five. Okay? And that's 75%. Now, if you got 75% on one of Ms. Rogers' tests, what do you suppose that grade would be? Would that be an A? No, no it's nowhere close, right? So th this is a really loose, liberal grading scale compared to what you're accustomed to. And I'll tell you why uh, in a couple minutes. To get that four grade, okay, which is the grade you should be aiming for, really, a four or five, you would need about 94 okay, out of the uh, 150 points. Now, remember I told you a little bit ago you could ignore the essays if you wanted to? I didn't advise that. I said you could. Okay, well, if you didn't even answer the essays and got 94 of the 100 multiple choice questions right, you'd be a four, okay, even without the essay. To pass the test, to get a score of three or above, you need roughly half, okay, 78 out of 150 points. Does this make you feel better? Okay, you want to go in confident, okay, because you are well prepared. Now, if you want to think about one part being scarier than the other, and if you're like most of your classmates and have more fear of the um, uh, free response than you do of the multiple choice, well, let's assume you don't do particularly well on the free response. Do you think you can get half the credit on the free response? How many of you are confident you can get half the credit? Raise your hands. You can do that. Okay, you can get half the credit. Let's assume that. Okay, let's assume you get half credit on the free response. Well, then how well would you need to do on the multiple choice? If you got half credit on the free response, you need about 87 out of 100 on the multiple choice to get your five. Now, if you did a little better on the free response, you could do a little worse on the multiple choice. Okay, but you'd need 87, what would normally be in the B range. 
get B ranked on the multiple choice, half credit on the essays. To get the four, you need about 69 multiple choice questions correct and half credit on the essays. And if your goal is a three to pass the test, okay, which is what you and I takes, if he accepts for credit, you need to get about half the multiple choice credit. Right. Okay, so th it's really not that demanding when it comes to um, how it's going to be scored. Are there questions there? Why don't they ask any questions? Are you guys feeling good about this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ask questions in class. Oh, yeah. All right. Maybe you just want to get off this cell. Maybe that's it. All right. Here's what I know. Okay. Based on everything I've seen with almost a quarter century in the program, here's what I would advise you in terms of the multiple choice. First of all, bring a good eraser, damn it. Okay. Think of how uh, horrible and ironic it would be. Because Somewhere there are going to be people that are really close to those dividing points between fives and fours, fours and threes, threes and twos, right? Let's imagine you answer a question, you're going back over the test, you realize you misread the question, and you know the answer isn't C, you're sure it's D. Okay? And you try to erase, but you brought some crappy eraser with you. Okay? So you leave a big black smudge there. So now the scanning machine thinks you tried to answer twice, and they go, cheater! They're not going to give you credit if they think you've answered twice, so you don't get credit for that answer, even though you know it. And that's the question that drops you from a 3 to a 2 for your final AP score. Can you imagine? That's how, how stupid it would be to not get credit for the course, not because you didn't know the psychology, but because you didn't learn a first grade skill. Erasing? Make sure that doesn't happen to you. And make sure you bring a good eraser and are willing to use it. I would make a written note of the end time when you start the test. Okay? I would literally, physically write it down. Now, adding 70 is hard. So here's what you do. You glance at the clock when you're told to open the test. You add an hour. That would take you to 3.51 and then add 10 more. That takes you to 401. And write 401 down. Don't write the start time down, write the end time down. So that at any point when you're taking the test, you say, how much time do I have left? Oh, it's over 401, I still got a half hour left. Okay, make a physical record of that so you don't have to devote any mental energy after that to try and keep track of the time. You've got a written record of how much time you have to. A very practical thing to do. You can write on the test. Ms. Rogers, do you let them write on the test? I don't. I don't either, because yeah. I want to use them year after year after mm -hmm. year, because it's a tax-supported institution. We're cheap. But you paid for this test. You get to write on it. So if it helps you to underline key terms, or to cross out answers that you know can't possibly be true, or to draw an arrow here, or to put a star by one that you want to go back and revisit, do it. Okay, it's your right to do that. You can mark up the test any way you want to. Um, next, take the test twice. Okay, I would go through it relatively quickly. People who struggle with the multiple choice normally struggle because they get stuck on questions. They'll get to one, and I'll say, oh, oh, I can do this. And you go back and try to reconstruct what you read and reconstruct what happened in class and try to imagine what the notes were like and where that information is. And if you're not careful, you've taken five minutes for that. And it doesn't take too many of those questions to put you in a position where by the time you get to the last quarter of the test, you don't have a time to read carefully. So you're rushing through. So go through the test first, picking off the easy fruit. Okay, go through and get the questions you know the answers to all the way up through the end to get the easy credit. Then take your leftover time and go back and revisit the other ones. That way you know you're going to get your easy credit. Does that make sense? A yeah, very basic strategy. Answer every question. The single stupidest thing you can do on the multiple choice portion of the test is to turn it in with an answer left blank. What's your chance of getting that right? If you leave it blank, zero percent. If you answer it without reading the question, your odds rise to 20 percent. 
Okay, now you make 20% on the stock market, you're doing pretty well. Okay, don't turn in any question where your chances are 0%. Now, part of that is time management again. Okay, know you make sure you have enough time. Okay, so that, that's a really stupid thing to do. Make sure that doesn't happen to you. And then, here's the one that gets people kind of rattled. And here's what you want to be careful for. Because there is no nationwide prescribed AP psychology textbook, because the College Board doesn't want to be in the business of writing or endorsing textbooks, there are probably 20 books that are used with some frequency across the country. Okay, you're going to find some questions that are covered in other books, but aren't covered in your book. And that experience is going to happen to every kid who takes the test on May 4th. And if you don't know that, that can rattle you in a hurry. But why don't I know this stuff? Where did this come from? I've never heard of that. Okay? And then you start to question your knowledge base and your confidence start to erode. And then 20 minutes later, they hand you the essay. And now you're all frazzled. Are you going to do as well on the essay? No. Expect this. This is one of the reasons the grading scale is so easy. Now, if you find 20 questions you never heard of, that means you didn't study, okay, or you were absent a lot. But to find five or six or seven that seem only vaguely familiar to you, okay, is perfectly normal. That will happen to you when you're taking the test. And even those questions, you can often eliminate some of the answer choices. So, well, I don't know what this thing in the stem of the question is, but I know what cognitive dissonance is, and that can't be the answer to that, so I know it's not cognitive dissonance. And now you narrow it down to uh, a guess out of four options or a guess out of three options. But whatever you do, don't leave it blank. Okay? Make sure you answer that question. All right, I'm, I'm beginning to, to know what to expect here. But any questions on this slide? Is this helpful? Yes. We're moving at the right pace? Too fast? Too slow? Any more jokes? Want me to dance? <laughs> um, you've probably seen this before. Mm -hmm. okay. Maybe it's even in your syllabus. But uh, the uh, AP uh, program, the Test Development Committee, the committee of uh, four high school teachers and four college professors who actually are responsible sorry, for uh, assembling your test each year, uh, they put this information out to teachers every year and they revise it every year. Okay, but these percentage figures are really, really important. This is the percentage of the multiple choice questions that will come from each of these categories. Okay, and it is a rock solid guarantee. And the way they enforce this is when they ask people to write questions. I wrote 20 potential questions for the AP exam this year. Okay, and the form they have you fill out requires you to identify which of these content areas your uh, that question refers to. And in fact, there's an expanded version of this outline that has subpoints and sub subpoints, and you actually have to pick one of those. This is uh, your guarantee and Ms. Rogers' guarantee that you're not going to get a question on the left field. Okay, you know it has to relate to one of those subpoints. But this can be very helpful to you in your last month of study. Okay, because now you know that you want to devote a disproportionate amount of time to research methods where you could get up to 10 questions. Okay, so you got to know what a case study is good for and what it isn't, and, and why uh, uh, experiments are more powerful than correlational studies and so forth. You need to know those brain parts and those neurotransmitters, 8 to 10 percent there. You need to know cognition, which includes memory. Okay, so you have to know those heuristics, and you have to know uh, models of memory and how memory operates, and then you get 8 to 10 percent out of social psychology, okay, those social psychology. And then you're, the last unit you were putting up on, we did together because it makes so much sense to do it together with uh, abnormal psychology and treatment. Together, that's 12 to 16 percent. So that's a big one as well. Okay. Now, if you were going to design it this way, you probably wouldn't have it that way. You want to have much more than two to four percent of that of consciousness because that's cool. That's interesting. You study hypnosis and sleep and all the rest of it. That this is what you have coming. The only thing I'd say about this is don't underestimate the importance of history and approaches. Because those approaches you looked at, words like cognitive, work by, words like humanist, words like uh, psychodynamic, uh, words like evolutionary, they're going to show up in other questions. The assumption is made by the people who write the questions that you have a really good understanding of what the word social cultural means. 
do you really know what it means to talk about a cognitive process? Okay? And they often show up in the essay questions. Okay? So make sure you have those basic approaches done. I don't think you have to worry about history prior to 1879. You don't have to worry too much about the ancient Greeks, Greeks and, and how Plato differed from Aristotle and all the rest of it. What happened in 1879? Wundt. Wundt. Say it right. Wundt. Wundt. Say it like a German says it. What did he do? And where did he discover like this? in his laboratory. That was the first time anybody had ever hung a sign outside of a psychology room that said, laboratory. And with all the emphasis today on the scientific underpinnings of psychology, that's when it began. Test development only has 100 questions to work with. They're going to stay focused on uh, experimental scientific psychology rather than that. Anything there? I'll stand over here for you. What else we got? Uh, advice regarding the free response questions. Note the time when you start the test, just like you did before. But this time, rather than adding 10 minutes past an hour, now you subtract 10 minutes. So it's 10 minutes either way. Don't get confused which way. Okay, but the multiple choice is 10 minutes more than an hour. The free response, 10 minutes less than an hour. So if I got the test now, I'd look at it, I'd add an hour that's 4 o'clock, and then I'd subtract 10 minutes. And I write that number down, okay, so you know exactly when it's done. Get to the point, and I'm sure you've covered this in the test you've written in school. There are many kinds of writing. Okay, there, there's uh, uh, writing for a formal English essay. There's writing uh, to leave a note for your mom on the counter. There's Twitter writing. There's uh, uh, text writing. And there's technical writing. They're, they all have their uses. They all are not good for other things. But you need to know that when they talk essay, which they don't, one of the reasons they technically call it a free response question is to disabuse you of the idea that this is an English essay with its introduction, its three paragraph body, and its conclusion. Okay? They want you to demonstrate your knowledge of psychology about the prompt that you've been given as clearly and succinctly as possible. And if you can imagine a reader who's been in Louisville, Kentucky this summer for um, uh, six days, almost at the end of a week, wading through the half million essays that you guys wrote on May 4th. And it's late afternoon, and he's tired and cranky, and his eyes hurt, and his butt hurts. And he picks up your essay, and you have a half-page introduction before you get to the point. Are, are you going to make friends with that reader? No. And the reader's going to be unhappy about that. And I know you're often told that quality is more important than quantity, right? But with AP Psych essays, that's really true. I can remember teachers emphasizing that when I was in school. I had to focus on quality. And then if you turn in a, a short quantity, high quality piece of work, you often got downgraded on it. Okay? But if you turn in something that was puffed up and padded, you got more credit. That doesn't work here. And I'll give you a good guideline in just a minute as to, as to how to keep that in mind. One of the worst things you can do is to engage your hand before you engage your brain. And sometimes people are so anxious to get started, they see a couple of words they recognize in the prompt, and then they start to write almost instantly before thinking. I see this every year. You can write a brilliant answer that doesn't apply to the question, which is absolutely Chock-a-block full of good, sophisticated knowledge of psychology. How much good does it do you on the AP exam? None. Your reader's going to say, cool, that kid knows this. Too bad they didn't write the right answer. They need to be credit. I've seen kids confuse the words hypothesis and hypnosis on the test. And instead of writing a paragraph about hypnosis, which was the prompt, they wrote a paragraph about hypotheses. Good paragraphs that didn't score them anything. Okay, this is very unforgiving. Okay, this is one of the worst things about rubric scoring. You don't get partial credit for things. Either you nail it or you don't nail it. You get the point or you don't get the point. There's no very gray area in between. It's kind of like being pregnant. You either are or you aren't. You can't be a little bit. Okay, it's an all or none type of, of scenario. So what I would suggest is taking about five minutes 